Hey, what's up, my friends? I'm Igor Saavedra, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, everyone. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, where the old rockers learn to groove. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. I'm so excited about this week's interview. An old friend of mine, I haven't even seen him in a while, but we go back a ways. Igor Saavedra, he is a pioneer of the eight-string electric bass. Very cool. And his story is a fascinating one. We've interviewed him. I've interviewed him a couple of times before. So I've, I've got the story, but it's some of it is worth reviewing a little bit. Plus, the last interview was a long time ago. So we want to get up to date on what Igor has been up to. He's a native of Chile. And after a very serious study of Kung Fu, Igor was all set to move to China to continue his martial arts education. Then there was one concert that he attended, one concert that changed his life forever, specifically the bass on that concert. And as a result of that experience, Igor made some very abrupt changes to his goals and his plans, and he embarked on a very serious study of bass and eventually became known internationally known as the top virtuoso of the eight-string electric bass. Hello, Igor, my friend. It's good to see you. How are you? Well, what an intro, my friend. Thank you for that. Sounds very nice. Oh, okay. I left out half. I could have gone on and on with all the stuff that you've done. <laughs> well, thanks for your intro. Well, I'm doing great. How about you? Long time. It shows you how much time you, have, you haven't interviewed me. Yeah. Well, the, the first interview we did on ForBassPlayersOnly.com with you was published in September of 2012. Yeah. And then uh, a little more recently, we published one in November of 2014. But you and I have hung out in California. We've hung out in Germany. We've hung out in Detroit. And who knows where else? Yeah, good memory. Yes, exactly. Detroit. Frankfurt, it uh, wasn't, Los Angeles. It, it wasn't Frankfurt. It was Magnuskirchen. No, it was both. It was Magnuskirchen and Frankfurt because we were at the Music Messe together too. Were you there? I was yes. there. Two thousand you, you played, you played on, the, on the on the one of my sponsors, former sponsors booth, and Phil we Jones. hung around there. Phil Jones. Yeah, I think it was there. Okay, I remember. Yeah, I'm th thinking about how big the Nam show is. That's nothing compared to the music mess. It was so yeah. big, and when I was there, they were making it bigger. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, people doesn't believe it's so big, but it's bigger than Nam. But it is. <laughs> it's about four times bigger than Nam. Anyway, uh, how are you? I want to get caught up on what you've been doing. Obviously, not everything you've been doing over the last eight years, but. Uh, you know what? Let, let's ease into it. There were a couple of things that you talked about in the first couple of interviews that I thought were very interesting. The first one was uh, your uh, the I, 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 sh I don't even have it committed to memory because it's a sign the vectorial synthesis technique. OK, it doesn't exactly roll off my tongue because I haven't said it too many times. But like I said, we touched on it in the other interviews, but that was a long time ago. Can you give a, uh, just provide a quick recap of what that is, how you came up with it and what it does? Well, people who knows me or follow my career uh, is very used to that. Uh, in, it's my right hand te technique. It's about uh, a very deep study on saving movements and making it uh, super efficient to the max, if possible, to the epitome of efficiency. And uh, I'm writing a book. I've been writing this book for the last 12 years. Not ready yet. I have books out about read, reading for bass and stuff like that. But this is, I hope, it's going to be ready when it's ready. But uh, it's about this, really, about a, a very, very efficient way of using the right hand, using these four hands, but sorry, four fingers, and uh, the way you move across the strings to make it simple as a definition or explanation. You remind me, of, do you know who Francois Raboff is? 
It's a no. French name. He was actually from Lebanon. He's an older man. He, he came up with uh, a system for, uh, I guess it was the left hand. Uh, he was on a beach one time and he saw a crab on the sand. And he thought, look how efficiently that crab moves its legs. There's got to be a way that we can take that and apply that to the base. And he's got his crab fingering. I've got an interview with him on the site, uh, Francois Rabat. So, uh, oh, interesting. Got to see that. Well, mine is with the right hand. So it's, okay. it's, it's different, but it's... You two would make a great team then. So what? You two would make a great team, the left hand and the right yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah, like the Victorial Crab. Something like that. There you go. <laughs> this is how ideas are spawned. Uh, the other thing is, and I think this might have been inspired by Gary Willis. It, it's the, the mic ramp that you have. Oh, for the, the, the mic ramp is, uh, yeah, the story goes like this. If, if, uh, very short. I met Gary in 93, about 93, when they came with Tribal Tech to Chile. And uh, I lent my amp to him. That gave me a little a little right to stay there on the sound check and you know how it is. And uh, I met the guy and uh, I saw that Willie's ramp of his fretless bass and I found it super incredible and I said, wow, it feels so good. And I was very young, so I just said, I shouldn't, but I did it. I said, yeah, but it it, it would it would make more sense to me how how I dare how. <laughs> But uh, if it contains the pickups and it could be adjustable, high adjustable. And he, he said, well, that's a very good idea. I'm very used to my stuff, but go for it, man. He, said, he was very, very kind. And I did it. <laughs> he encouraged oh. me. And that's the difference between the Willis ramp and the mic ramp that you can see now in many, many bases all around. I developed that in 95, the first prototypes. And it and it started to get uh, known. I mean, a ramp that has four screws on the corners, you know, and it has the pickups that you see in many luthier custom bases now. And that's my invention. Uh, and uh, well, in my bases, you adjust it from behind, from the back of the body. So you don't see the screws on top. I think that's way more elegant and beautiful. And Some don't... versions are have the screws on top but okay that's but the story the, of the micro the main difference with yours though is instead of gluing it down when you glue it down it can't be adjusted so when you screw it down it can be adjusted up and down depending on how you want it for the pickups. there are two main 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 differences that and the other that the pickups are behind the ramp in the willis ramp the pickup is on the side and the uh, ramp is here and the pickup is here so it's it's very it, it it comes from there, and I always acknowledge that because every invention in, in the history of the world comes from something. So there's no invention that is coming out of nothing in, in the history of the world. So I acknowledge Gary because it comes from there, but it's a different animal, of course. It's, yeah. it's a different type of ramp. You can divide them in really in two. The Willis ramp and... I, I didn't put Igor's ramp to mine. I, I didn't do that, but I named it Mike Ramp. Mike Ramp. Okay. Let's talk about the eight string bass because there are, I, I can't think of anybody else that plays an eight string bass. Or when people think of it, they might think about it like a, you know, like a 12 string guitar, with, which is really four strings doubled. That's not what you do. You have EADG and then you yeah, like have this. the lower like this one. one. On, the, on the poster there. Yeah. So it's all in fourths, right? So you yeah, have all in fourths from F, so F, C, G, D, A, you know, E, B, F sharp. Yeah. It's in fourths. And uh, I came up with the idea in 1999, mostly because I have small hands. You cannot, you don't have context to get it, but I have really small hands. I mean, very small. I'm 6'2", but I have small hands. So I started to dig into the six string bass because the intervals you know vertical is easier than extending horizontally and uh, in a moment i said i need more for for my small tiny hand and uh, you know 
extended intervals to play some chords and stuff like that, which I like. And I started at the end of the 90s to, to go for solo bass, because that's another aspect of my career that I'm one of the first to start with this in, in, in the bass community. Michael Manring, Todd Johnson, these guys were before me. And uh, I really, I always acknowledge the, the people who's before me. And then I think it's me that started to, to develop something on the solo bass uh, field strongly, I would say. I'm not saying that I play good or not. I'm just, I, I'm just saying I was dedicating to this. And even, it was even more notorious because in Latin America is way more crazy than in the States where you have more stuff going. But in Latin America, which is very conservative, was not easy. And in 99, I came up with idea because I, I met uh, Bill Dickens. He, he was playing seven. Seven string. I can't and, and, and nine, but there was no eight. There was no eight anywhere in the world. And uh, and I said, oh, that's that's gotta be me. That's gotta be me. <laughs> okay, and so I, four wasn't enough. That. Five, six, those weren't enough. Seven was close, but it was. What, what is the seventh? It, it, what's the eighth string? Is that higher than Bill's or lower? So you go to what's that? F sharp then. Right? F sharp. So yeah, I needed that. I was looking for that sound either because it was still within the the ear uh, hearing range. You know, it's twenty three hertz. Uh, the F sharp totally within uh, ear reach. The fundamental, I would say, if you go lower to a C sharp again for a nine or whatever nine going back. Now that C sharp is sixteen hertz to seven. It's it's too low. I mean, you're faking it somehow because you are not listening to the most of the people is not going to be listening to the fundamental. So that's the reason I stopped there. And on the high end, I stopped on the F because. The, the sound of a, uh, the winding, it was still okay to me. It, it sounded like a bass string. If I go to the B flat, it, it's just plain steel. There are some brands that are like uh, building uh, B flat with winding, but it's too, too high to my taste. It's like really a guitar sound. So I, I wanted mellow, sweet, like meaty, woody, you know what I mean. I, I like that. So I think that's... the G is plenty high. I think the G string is plenty high for a bass. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but but you know what I what I do, which people does not uh, know, I very rarely go beyond the 14th fret, which is a G, which would uh, be the last G of a 24 fret 4 string. And yeah, well, that's, 90, that's very high for a bass. Yeah, but yeah, but ninety-five percent of the time, I'm within that that range. But don't forget, I go even way lower than a four-string bass. <laughs> so yeah, when they start, but that's like a guitar. Well, that this guitar sounds way lower than a regular bass. I say. <laughs> so uh, it's quite that's a very like relative. So from from the lowest note, from the open F sharp string, which sounds strange to me to say, it's F sharp string to the highest note on the F string. How how big? That's five octaves. How many octaves is a piano? It's not much more than that. <laughs> Eight. Eight. Okay. So no, but it's 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 not about playing higher note, very high notes. It's where you play. Uh, the texture of the song where you play lower notes, which mm -hmm. I'm looking for, and easy access for my small hand. My, I have 15.5 millimeters on the bridge string separation. You say, oh, but it's too narrow. Well, narrow for who? Narrow for my hand? It is not. It's perfect for my hand. So, you know, you, so it's you've played with a lot of other people, but you, you are also a solo, unaccompanied solo bass player are, are you doing more of that than playing like you know in a band yeah well as many of us i started my career playing session uh, or playing in groups bands and recording and all this stuff but in at the end of the 90s i i saw it quite clearly when i had my egg string in my hands i said now it's 
the moment, 1999, I go for it. So for the last 23 years, I've been almost exclusively did with very rare exceptions, some recordings for an album for whatever, a drummer or guitar player or some whatever exception, uh, 100% dedicated to solo bass. When was the last time you picked up a four string? Do you have one? <laughs> I have one. I have one for my lessons. I mean, of course, I have one very, a very basic Yamaha $150 Yamaha, which is perfect. It's yeah. the perfect base for teaching. Uh, they can do whatever with him. I don't care <laughs> if they break it, whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, I take it some sometimes, and I slap on it or do whatever. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm come, I'm, I come from there. I mean, I had my jazz bass, six seventy-seven jazz bass. Uh, sorry, seventy-seven precision. I recorded many stuff with that. Then I moved on the five string a Yamaha. Then I moved to the six string a PBTL six. <laughs> it's a wonderful bass, as, as you might remember. It's the details are incredible for for a nineties bass. Graphite wow. cover on the on the headstock. Graphite on the inside the neck. A Makassar ebony. A color multi adjustable bridge, which is incredible, an incredible bridge. Uh, a, a preamp like this. It, it was so sophisticated. And I had this bass for like seven, eight years, and then moved on the to the eight, and the solo career started kind of there, ninety nine. So what's keeping you busy now? I know you've been traveling a lot lately. Yeah, yeah. Well, after pan the pandemics, which was awful for all of us, uh, I can say that I, I it was not so hard on me because my lessons even increased. So. Uh, I mean, money-wise, I was totally okay. It's like nothing happened. But uh, of course, the thing I like the most, which is playing concerts in around the world, which is what I I've been doing for the last twenty years, couldn't. I mean, that stopped cold. And then now I I started again two months ago. I went out. That's it. I'm playing, doing concerts. I'm very happy. And uh, well, since the last interview, uh, some European tours, some uh, M Berkeley master classes, ah. which is very important to me as a Latin American player, being able to do that. I thank especially to Steve Bailey for that. Very nice guy with me always. And yep. uh, many, many, many concerts all around. I mean, Australia, Tokyo, I mean, Japan tour. Wow. Uh, ooh, Latin America, everywhere you can imagine. The states, a lot of states, and haven't stopped for the last, with exception of the pandemics in the last ten years. Wow, good for you. Yeah, well, you do have a very interesting thing that, uh, that I've always enjoyed hearing. Thank you, John. Well, it's a different stuff, you know. It's different. So. Product. Tell me a, a little bit more about your gear. What what kind of bass is it that you play? Your primary bass. Okay, I tell I tell you the actual my actual. Well, this is the fifth version of Octavius, as you might remember. That's yes. that's the funny funny name. Everybody knows my bass by that name. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a Mark Ramsey bass. The one I have now, RMI. I'm not. And now I just signed in Costa Rica with a with a great luthier. A former student, which is so appealing to me, he's starting. I chose the woods, everything, and he's starting for the sixth version of the new Octavius, which is going to have some upgrades and, and stuff like that. It's going to be ready in 2023, uh, 20, 2023, sorry. That's great. And uh, La Bella strings, right? La Bella strings, they have the extended range bass line that has my name, which is so flattering. I mean, the whole line has my name, so it's incredible. Uh, now I moved from uh, AMP. This happened this month from AMP uh, sponsor. Now I'm, I'm with GR. I just signed a seven page contract, GR base from Italy. Uh, they are making insane stuff they have these cabinets that are 800 watts and seven kilograms wow 
uh, uh, carbon fiber. Amazing. It's incredible. They sound incredible and they are like as a feather. I am with May chairs that you can see here. Ah, okay. May chairs from Germany. Analysis plus cables, still current. They, these guys make cables that you wouldn't believe. I mean, this, these guys are really in, they are very expensive, I have to say, but they are totally worth it. North Strand, which are my pickups, always custom in my bases, made, made by them, especially for my bases all the time. I also want to add uh, that I'm using ergo straps, which you might know, Victor Wooden uses them, you know, the famous Yin Yang one, and uh, they are making it. It's a Chilean company. Very, they're doing really great business. They have a new owner now. And uh, I was out. I mean, I was with another company, but given the fact that this new, new uh, owner I like how he's doing business. I got back to the company. So we're working hard on a new signature product. And uh, that's that's uh, one of my new deals. I mean, that uh, I don't want to forget about. Nothing but gratefulness with my sponsors. And thanks for asking about them because it's always, I mean, like channels like yours, which are very on demand and very respected. Uh, I mean, I, I get to many people that are going to see and hear what I'm saying about my, my sponsors. Let's switch gears a little bit. You, you, you mentioned teaching. For bass players only, as you know, is a bass instruction site. And uh, you, know, you heard me at the beginning where the old rockers learn to groove. Most of the people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, mostly men. We get a fair bit of women. And uh, you know what happens when you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s? Things like arthritis, tendonitis, pain in the, the back, the neck, the hands, the shoulders, you know. Oh, so uh, what I always try to impress on the students is you don't have to be Billy Sheehan or Stu Ham or, or Jocko or, or Igor Saavedra to, to, to lay down a simple groove that feels good and it can really make a big impact on the music and on you know getting the people up to dance and all that stuff making the music feel good without over exerting yourself and and putting undue strain and stress and wear and tear on your muscles and bones so i wanted to give you a little bit of context because i want to ask you what advice do you have for somebody like that who wants to learn bass? What do you think is important for them to know? Well, yes. So what you said is totally, uh, I mean, right on the money. Because, of course, the, expect the expectations are, have to be realistic, first of all. Uh, and they have to, I, in my opinion, my advice would be focus on having fun. And the rest will come or not. But doesn't matter if you're having fun, because if you're having fun, you're having fun. <laughs> so if it comes something that, I mean, let's say somebody heard you and said, oh, this guy, and you sign a contract, whatever, I'm just saying, well, good. If it does not happen, but you had a great time, or, or you're having it, by, I mean, this uh, oh moment, like, it's like, oh, oh, the scale, or... Oh, how nice this sound, or I didn't know you could do this, or uh, what year you, oh, this, yes, I tried this uh, bass or whatever, I'm very happy. And you're having fun on the, on the trip, on the very trip, the voyage, I would say, I'm not thinking in any destiny or in any destination, sorry. Uh, it will be worth it. So I tell them, and I've had many, over 50 too, uh, so so it's like have fun and it, it works like this they lower the expectations and and if they're really like really good well things happen and they they do more stuff and well great but if it does not happen the whole trip was incredible for them so that's what i would say to start have fun don't put too much pressure on yourself it's it's makes no sense if you are going to do that don't do it it's not going to be a good thing for you what about the future it's great to see that you're out you're touring you're traveling you're performing you're, you're doing all those things 
any and you you mentioned a book you've been working on for for what'd you say 12 years yeah. <laughs> finish that up man finish it <laughs> i know but i always uh, it's never right it's like oh this thing should be like this i'm gonna correct this and improve it but it's gonna it's gonna happen done is better than perfect yeah yeah no I, I i'm not i'm not looking for perfection i'm looking for satisfaction i mean in a moment it, it gotta be good enough to me yeah. to 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 publish you're not looking for perfection you're looking for satisfaction but it sounds to me like you won't be satisfied unless it's perfect <laughs> yeah it sounds like that i i i but it's it's not it's not really that i'm i'm waiting for that no waiting i'm working really on that enough enoughness enoughness <laughs> i like that you know i i just had my 10th book published this year and i think there were i don't know three or four of them that are at least in the second edition or maybe third edition so you can you can update those later on if you get a better idea because you know you, you whoever the publisher is or if you self-publish you know that they, they you, you print a certain number and when they sell out you can reprint them or that's an opportunity to put a, a second edition my funk bass book came out in 1992 victor wooten wasn't even mentioned anywhere in that book yeah 92 he was like people were starting to notice him but he wasn't uh, you know so it was john patitucci that, that uh, wrote the foreword and who else Stu ham endorsed it and a bunch of other people but yeah. i went to the publisher in 2012 and i said what do you think about a 20-year anniversary edition of funk bass and he says, yeah, I like that idea. I went back to every guy that endorsed it. There were 10. Uh, the ones I mentioned, Mark Egan endorsed it. Bob Cranshaw endorsed it. I can't even remember who all else. And I said, can you say, can you reiterate your endorsement? Say something like, 20 years later, it's still a great book. To <laughs> Good. Every single one of them came through. And there's a picture of me on the left from 1992 and a picture of me on the right from 2012. So, you know, I, I hope I'm inspiring you to just, just get it done and get it out there. We need it. We need it. The people need your stuff, Igor. Yeah, yeah, I, you're right. But uh, I'm very close to that moment, believe me. It's like my books are kind of big, you know, uh, they're like texts. It's, so I'm very dense, I have to admit. So uh, I, go, I go like that. There, there are many ways to write a book, all of them valid, and they have different purposes uh mine has a little component of statement if you want so it, it's 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 a lot of thing in there a lot of stuff i have to really uh, be very like uh, deep on the analysis and uh, to justify everything i say because i go somehow against against the mainstream in many aspects john thanks so much for your interview it was a real pleasure and i invite all all the people that could be interested in my work to follow me on my social media uh my website igorsavedra.com you will be very welcome i teach lessons too so you can ask for that as well it was a pleasure my friend thank you so much for joining me today and i sure our people got a lot out of it our our audience our viewers thank you very much keep doing what you're doing get that book done continue traveling i hope to see you soon you're watching for bassplayersonly.com where the old rockers learn to groove i'm john leapman founder and first baseman once again thanks to our very special guest igor saavedra i will see you all next week in the meantime let's play bass